Hey everyone, a couple minutes late. Uh, I just had a surprise from some of our friends. It's actually my wedding anniversary um, and some friends brought us some champagne and some food. So I'm a little breathless. Uh, and welcome to Backstage Pass where I get to chat with a lot of my musician friends, talk about what goes on behind the scenes, what life is like as a musician and all kinds of other things. Today I'm being joined by my friend Eve Giliotti and I'm gonna bring her in. Wait. Can you I see me you? now? I can see you and I can hear you. You have me. Oh, Yay, thank Eve, you. welcome. Hi. Oh my I'm gosh. I'm so sorry. Wait. I'm, you know, I, I'm using, I'm putting you in my trusty little holder here. I'm using, um, some, my, uh, I'm using my husband's iPhone because it's better. Mm -hmm. And then it kept on jumping off to a Bluetooth headphone somewhere across the apartment so oh, and right. we're, we're back so we're back <laughs> yay we're back thank well, you welcome. for your patience of thank course. you i was running a couple minutes late too so but here we are and i'm so glad to have you um thank so you. eve i'm gonna just give a, a brief rundown eve is a mezzo soprano she has sung with uh, so many opera houses including the met the san francisco opera houston grand opera mm -hmm. she has performed with the la philharmonic seattle symphony Detroit Symphony, Baltimore, Milwaukee, among others. She's worked with a whole a slate of composers, live composers, uh, in collaborations and premieres, which I want to get to. And yes. you're doing something in January that sounds really, really interesting, this uh, Entitled Inspired by Yes, Fidel, that project. So I want to get to that too. But let's really Absolutely. start at the beginning. So could you just tell us a little bit about early years and what it was like, when did you find your voice or when did you know you could sing? Um, was that something you wanted to do from a you know a young age or did that come later? Um, you know, it, it was one of those things that was always there. Mm. I don't know, it was one of those things, it took me a really long time to find my voice, right? <laughs> but as, as an adult, but as a child, I always sang and it was always something that was just almost instinctual Mm -hmm. And it brought me such joy and it provided a place of, um, it provided an outlet for me that was, uh, that I needed. And um, then when I was about 13, um, people from uh, Yardley PA, shout out to Yardley, will know this story. I, uh, I was 13 playing Mother Abbess in, the, in some high school production mm -hmm. of The Sound of Music, mm -hmm. right? Uh -huh. And... Um, you know, it's one of those things that you, it just, sometimes you just have it in you and it comes out in these unexpected ways. And I just opened my mouth and this sound came out. You know, I didn't mm. think about it. I mean, I wish I could go back to that moment, you know, where you're right. like just singing uh -huh. and uh, making this sound that, that I just got this reaction from mm -hmm. um, everyone. And it was a real discovery for me because the discovery was that it was powerful. Right. You know, that it was, it was a powerful in the way of being able to reach people and to affect people. Mm -hmm. So that was the first time that I really understood the responsibility. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, um, and then from there, um, I didn't know what opera was really. I mean, oh, growing up in, okay. you, know, you know, growing up in uh, kind of middle-class suburbia, my culture, my cultural experiences were musical theater right. and Broadway. And so, and I fell in love with that. And that was really, um, I wanted to be an actor. I wanted to be on Broadway. Of course, mm -hmm. I never belted, you know, I had this right, like, right. Uh -huh. big giant sound and yeah. I'm like, I want to be on Broadway. <laughs> so, um, I eventually found my way or uh, opera fa classical music found me, I guess mm -hmm. I should say. Mm -hmm. I, I continued to follow the path that kept on opening up to me. And, um, you know, uh, it took me a while actually to figure out what my place was within the classical music world mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because I didn't have I didn't have that background and I didn't identify with classical music passionately in the same way that I identified with um, 
acting and musical theater. And so it took me a while to find, yeah. to find my place mm -hmm. and to mm -hmm. figure out where I really connected with the material. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but I recognized the power of the, of the art form mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. always um, was so grateful to be being, to be exploring my voice and expressing myself um, as a student and coming up and figuring that out. But then as far as a career, what that would look like was never right. super clear to me. Yeah, yeah. I don't think it's super clear to anyone. So <laughs> I know, you know I know. Some credit for that. Yeah. Um, so something you said was really interesting, the sense of connection, uh, when you feel like you're really communicating with an audience, when there, there's an energy there, I think for those of, you know, people who are not performers can feel that as an audience. But what does it feel like from the giving side? What, what's that sort of visceral feeling oh, for you? Wow. I mean, well, two things. I mean, like I said, a uh, responsibility, right? Mm -hmm. um, you mm -hmm. definitely feel like, I feel like I am, I know I'm a communicator and the responsibility of, um, of what music and art can do for other humans, mm -hmm. right? So the responsibility uh, and the, some of my colleagues were talking about education in music and they kept on coming back to the word of service. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's like musicians really are providing, they're, they're, they dedicate their life to a practice, mm -hmm. right? It's a mm -hmm. practice, it's a lifelong practice that provides service for humanity. Right. I mean, the art artists are, servers are servers of humanity. I mean, we are here to um, remind each other of what it is to be human. Mm -hmm. And when I'm on the stage, I am, it is um, another, I'm going to get all um, woo woo here, but it's really another level of, uh, of being. It's another state of mm -hmm. being. It's like you are elevated into this other place of consciousness and you are letting the music feed through you, you mm -hmm. are um, communicating through this powerful medium. Mm -hmm. And however the audience is receiving it is, is I have no control over all I can do mm -hmm. is provide the vessel for that, um, that experience, right? Right, right. Um, so what does it feel like? I mean, part of it is like an adrenaline situation, which mm -hmm. is, you know, I, I kind of joke, um, you know, I don't jump, I don't uh, bungee jump off bridges, but I <laughs> sing on stage in front of thousands of people, right? I mean, it's kind it's, of the same it's, thing, right? Yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, it's uh, for pure adrenaline junkies, performing live is, is a is a big high. But, um, but then also, um, when I know that I'm connected into that higher energy plane, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it's really, it's really experiencing what it is to be alive on a, on a, on a different, on a different level. And the, mm -hmm. and you know that the audience is experiencing it too. And that's the, that's the power of live performance, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, mm -hmm. that's what's so, that's what's um, so challenging right now with this time is that, right. um, you know, some beautiful things are happening through technology, but at the core of it, we're human beings. And since the beginning of time, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. getting together in a room and making sound. Right, right, you know, right. That's, Absolutely. that's yeah. pretty, that's pretty basic. It's it a pretty basic pretty need. Basic. So, yeah. yeah. I'm gonna come back to that thought, but you sort of brought up your musical theater background and you mentioned acting and singing. And so I've always wondered, in an opera, I mean, you're, you're tasked with two separate yet c completely conjoined things. You have to sing beautifully, but you have to sing beautifully as a character. So how do you sort of meld those two together? Do you have to approach singing and acting separately or does that become yeah. sort of like, you know, like, I don't know, like it just no, combines it's like one what thing. comes first, the chicken or the egg? And, yeah. You know, what, you know, the, the, the lifelong debate of words versus music mm -hmm. and um, I mean, it's such a great question, and I don't know if there's really one good answer. I think so much of it depends on the material. I see. And um, and what the composer and the librettist have created, and then the director's vision. I mean, there's mm -hmm. there there are there are many um, points of input 
in um in in the piece as it stands and then your job is to take all that input in and then and then channel it and mm -hmm. um with your own interpretation right um so it's definitely it's definitely challenging i mean i think each piece has a um has a different um rest combination mm -hmm. of uh, a recipe of uh of those needs i think if you are in my opinion if you are doing something that's possibly more um of a more bel canto where mm -hmm. so much of the so much of the drama and the character interpretation is really written in the music mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um then just by understanding that and on because and there's really there may not be very much in the libretto ah okay you know there yeah. may not be it may not be a lot of words it may be an entire aria on an ah you know or <laughs> Right, right. You know, and, or and just a melisma, and it's like, well, what's the composer doing with that melisma, and mm -hmm. how are you shaping the musical phrase mm -hmm. to portray the action of right, the scene and right, what the character right. wants? You know, so there's that, right? Mm -hmm. But then there's another. There are other styles and schools of um, writing where it is so text based, right? Um, and so you know, you look at something like a Piero Lunaire or something mm -hmm. where it's literally Sprechstimme. It's exactly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so much of it is in the words and mm -hmm. um, the music as well, but you really uh, take a lot of the cues from the, from the language. Right, um, right. And sometimes it's a real even balance. Mm -hmm. And sometimes so, it's not, so. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes yeah. one takes preference over the other. So oh, interesting. Is there a language that you particularly enjoy singing in and one that maybe you don't? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I really like singing in English. Yeah. You know? um, I really like it. Um, language has been one of the things for me, I think that's been the biggest hurdle. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of if you are really wanting to reach a certain level um, in our art form, you really do need to have lived in one of the main, of the European countries that really, um, either Italy and, or Germany or France, mm -hmm. right. and really be fluent in mm -hmm. um, at least one of those. I have studied Italian for years, I have studied German for years, and mm -hmm. I can make my way to the bathroom and order off of the menu, you know? <laughs> Those are useful but, things, but. Yes. Um, and, you know, I don't wanna sell myself short, but um, it never, it, it never um, came easy to me. Mm -hmm. And so I always gravitated towards language where there is no veil you know, often mm -hmm. if you're not a native speaker, right. you are singing that language through translating it yes. in yes. your own, so, right? So there's that extra mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. veil, right? right. And right. so right. there's an immediacy when I sing in English. Right, right. Because I'm not translating, you know? That's really interesting. I had thought of it that way. Yeah. 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 And I, I wish it were not so. <laughs> <laughs> but. <laughs> but. I yeah. gotta be honest with myself, you know, and that's not to say that I, that I don't work at it and I don't understand the importance. Um, but I think sometimes, you know, if you want to flip it, you think, well, what would it sound like if a non English speaker was singing Sondheim? What would mm. that sound like? Right. A little odd, probably. It would be a little yeah. odd. Right? Yeah. I mean, without that, with the, the understanding of the subtleties of the language and the intonation and, mm -hmm. you know, it's pure style. Right, right. And I think it just comes with um, mastery of the language. So that is one of the things that I continue to, um, to work on, but then also embrace the fact that I happen to sing in English easily and well. So, you know, some, again, like walk through the doors that open for you sometimes, you yeah. know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so interesting. I, I don't think most people who are casual opera fans or don't know a lot about classical music really think about that fact that unless you really know a language from inside out, it's because performance is so spontaneous, even if, you know, the 
the text is set, the music is set, the staging is set. There's so much unknown that happens in performance. And to be able to, <laughs> yeah. you know, be flexible within that, you need to sort of know the language and its subtleties, really, to be able to yeah. turn a musical phrase. And I think that's that's really quite amazing. Yeah, and even, and just style, again, like if you listen to a someone singing Carmen who's fluent in French, it's going to sound a lot different. Mm-hmm than someone who is not. Right. And that's not to say that that person who is not has not studied the language and learned the diction mm -hmm. and knows what they're saying, but it's right. just it's just that next level of immediacy. And right. I think, um, yeah. And for some people it comes easy. I mean, I think the educational system in this country, also as Americans, we're not as exposed to, to, um, to many various, to many languages, yeah. you know? I mean, Absolutely. you go to Europe and you turn on the radio and there's pop music in all of these other languages yeah. and it's very available and mm -hmm. it's very much more fluent, right? Yes. So America is very much a bubble in that way. Mm -hmm. um, and then the conservatory training in the States, although I, I hope it has changed, but when I was coming up really, um, for the most part, diction classes took precedence over language classes. Right. So it was more about how can you pronounce it the properly production as opposed, of, yeah, 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 as than, opposed to really getting inside. And, mm -hmm. and again, like when I was young and I was a student, you take a lot for granted and maybe I was lazy or maybe it didn't come to me very easy, mm -hmm. but I, I didn't get up extra early to get to that German class. Right. Right. I mean, this is like true confessions and um <laughs> tell us go ahead confess away you know so i mean it's like um yeah so it is what it is but yeah. it's been a big for me it's been like one of my biggest observations and kind of things that i um pay pay a lot of attention to and continue to try to get over that hurdle mm -hmm. that makes a lot of sense so we were talking about spontaneity and performance. And I did want to ask you because opera is such a combination of, you know, text and music and theater. And there's so many moving parts that it's one of the, I guess, forms of classical performance where you're more apt to have an absolute disaster just because there are so many things happening. Um, in fact, I, I remember books called a hundred opera disasters that I read right. when I was a kid. Yeah, that's a famous one. Um, yeah. So c do you have an opera disaster or something? I can't memorable? believe you don't already know my opera disaster. I thought I was partially famous for my opera oh, disaster. Oh, no, I, remind me then. Maybe I've forgotten. So I, one of my claim to fames, and I have been able to check off a Metropolitan Opera ovations, ovation off my bucket list mm -hmm. by default because I'm the Valkyrie that fell off the machine. Did you oh hear my God, this? no, I did not hear this story. Wait, wait, go ahead, go, backtrack, backtrack. You have not backtrack. heard this story. Okay, please don't tell uh, the story. I will make a long story short. And first I will just say that I think that the Lepage ring, while controversial, was an incredible feat and everyone worked so tremendously hard in putting it together and I have all the respect in the world and I was honored to be a part of it. But whenever you take risk, mm -hmm. you take risk. Right. And fourth show in the original production, um, something happened. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with the production, but the Valkyries um, descend down the planks and dismount onto the front apron. And okay. um, something went wrong and I didn't make it. And I <laughs> ended up having a little bit of a fall um, in oh front God. of 4,000 people. Right. I got walked off the stage and everyone thought that I was hurt. I was okay. Mm -hmm. I had a little, little bumps. I think it looked a lot scarier than it was. Right. And uh, it was funny because the only, because I was in shock. And the only thing I could think of was how much time does my cover have to get her costume on? Oh you know, like God. I got to yeah. go back out there, which right. is kind of hilarious because I'm, you know, one of multiple women jumping around the stage and mm -hmm. if worse came to worse and I wasn't there, the show would go on. But, you know, I was like, I must go back out there. <laughs> you know? And um, I jumped back out at the Hoyo to Ho chorus oh, and the wonderful. entire audience just went, whoa, you know, because they thought I was dead. Right. I was not dead. I was fine. And, um, and uh, so that's my ovation at the Met. But, you know, that's kind of, um, 
that's kind of an infamous story, I guess. And uh, I, I live to tell the tale. I survived the machine. I think I should get a t-shirt. You, you should get a t-shirt. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that often audiences or, you know, people not in the music industry don't understand how much it takes to be a performer and things that happen that you have to overcome and, you know, the surprises on stage that there is that sort of showbiz sense of the show must go on and that you yeah. need to sort of put yourself in that place no matter um, how exhausted or hurt or anything. Oh, you just keep going. Things. Yeah. You just yeah. keep going. I mean, and, uh, and you also understand, you know, as a performer, you understand that everything that goes on on that stage, like you, you've mentioned spontaneity. And I think that it's beautiful if you are prepared enough to be in a place where you can be spontaneous. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But for I the most it. part, everything that goes on on that stage is so completely planned out as it right. should be, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there are so many people that work so hard to come together and create something that looks like it's happening for the first time, right? Right, right exactly. And, and so, um, yeah, I mean, that was one of the things, particularly with that project, were the hundreds of people that were involved in making that um, happen, mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. um, night, uh, you know, show after show. And, um, and the, other, this, the other thing um, that I was thinking was, um, and to go on a slight tangent, was, mm -hmm. you know, being a performer. Mm-hmm. You're, you don't live in a bubble. Real life is happening. Right. And then you have to put on your dress and mm -hmm. warm up and get up in front of people and yep. transport them, right? Mm -hmm. do, do your job. However, when you have other things happening in your life, like an eight month old with a double ear infection, mm -hmm. you know, and you haven't slept and right. you have to go sing the Taliana in Algeri. Oh God. Um, you know, you just kind of say a little prayer and really rely on your technique. And I guess right. this was going back to also, you know, being so prepared so you can a handle when things get a little off the rails, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you can rely on that technique. You can rely on the team around you. Um, and be like, be so prepared and in sync with your colleagues that you can have those moments of inspiration and you right. can have those moments of of true spontaneity yes. because you're because you're ready you know exactly because you have that foundation of right. everything being solved that you can extrapolate and sort of go off on that which is kind of amazing um so sort of talking about preparation which you just touched on so you've had an incredible sec success with the standard operatic literature and you've done so many roles but i'm really interested in now your work with living composers and you know, as classical musicians, I think we all sort of feel this, this curatorial responsibility to present these great works of art. But, you know, on the flip side, it's so important to keep that art developing. And so, right. so how do you create your space for collaboration? And what is the preparation of a new work like? And how does that differ from, you know, preparing a new role of a standard rep? Yeah, such great questions, Sarah. <laughs> like to know what people think and how they come to yeah. Work. so yeah um again it depends on the circumstance it depends on the project mm -hmm. um if you are coming into something it depends on the team it depends on whether or not the people behind the table are in a space in a collaborative space mm -hmm. or in a place where they are, um, they kind of have a, they have a product, they have a baked cake and they want you to, to just like be on top of it. Right. Like just <laughs> yeah. the topper. Mm -hmm. Um, and it depends and it depends on what, it depends on how they are developing the piece. Okay. Um, I mean, I'm just going to do a quick shout out right now mm -hmm. when we are finished our amazing, incredible conversation. Mm -hmm go over to Opera Philadelphia's YouTube mm. because Breaking the Waves is streaming. Oh, no kidding. Okay. Yeah. So Missy Mazzoli and Royce Fabric mm -hmm. um, wrote this, just the stunning opera in, uh, based on the Lars von Trier film. Mm. And it is now streaming in the digital festival at Opera Philadelphia and it's starting this evening. Fantastic. So definitely check okay. that out. Okay. Yeah. 
But that was a process that I had come in, in the, not the very, very beginning, but mm -hmm. in the beginning. And they had really um, explored the musical language by utilizing us in the workshop format. Hmm. And they really built the piece with um, specific voices in mind because they were, we were their tools, you know, right, we right. were there for them. And it was an honor and a pleasure to facilitate the work in that way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but what I'm thinking, you know, same thing with Dark Sisters, with Nico Muley's piece. Mm -hmm. um, we were very much uh, uh, in a workshop situation where he would be writing based on the, our sounds in his ear. Okay, okay. Um, and that's a gift. I yeah. mean, that is Absolutely. exciting, yeah. Um, but that's how it's always I've been. I lost done. you for a second. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Am I back? Wait, there, you're back. You're back. Okay. I was hoping this would not happen. Yeah. It's sometimes okay. I don't know. Um, but that's how it how it always happens, right? Composers mm -hmm. have their singers that they know, that they love, that they want right. to work with, and they write for their voices, and then other, and then others come in and interpret the role and mm -hmm. it lives on. And that's also how you know the strength of a piece is that it can go from production right, to right. production. Yeah, that, and, that was gonna be my next question. Cause if a role is created on you and then that goes to a different singer with a whole different set of parameters. Have you been in the, that, that situation where you're taking over a role that's been created for someone else or? You know, off the top of my head, I don't mm -hmm. think so. Okay. Okay. I definitely feel like, um, especially with Breaking the Waves, um, it's having an incredible life mm -hmm. uh, beyond this particular production that we did. And, um, you know, although I would love to continue to live in that w role because I think the longer you get a chance to explore a piece, the richer it gets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the fact that it has had this beautiful life with other incredible singers mm -hmm. is great for everybody, right? Right. right. Um, but I don't know if I've been on the other end and mm. if I have, I'm not aware that I have. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's interesting because it's music, so you don't own it. <laughs> right, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah, but somehow it's, it's, it's a yeah, but, but I do feel ownership of it. Right, Absolutely. Right, exactly. Yeah, I do feel yeah, like, yeah. you know, that role is my one of, it's mine, but it's not mine. It, <laughs> needs, to, it needs to go out into the world and be sung by many incredible right. interpreters because right. um, everybody brings their own individuality to the work and thus you get, you find more things and you get yeah. more, you can get more from it, you know, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hmm. So speaking of roles, you are going to be both creative director and performer for this untitled uh, project that yeah is inspired by in film January. stills. Um, so so how let me just about? okay yeah I I mean I'm really excited to talk about this. Let me just clarify that the January um, and I need to update my website, but the, the January workshop mm -hmm. happened, and that we oh, are working. Okay. Yes, it happened. Um, gotcha. The workshop happened, which was our second workshop, mm -hmm. and we are, um, you know, pre-pandemic, -pan we were um, we were aiming for a fall of twenty one premiere. Ah, uh, okay. Um, but and it's you know we're still on track, but again, we are uh, fortunate to be flexible. Um, so when it is safe, we will be ready. Um, the beauty about this piece is that it, it is an immersive cross-disciplinary piece. It's ah, meant to be okay. staged. Yeah, I'm very interested in working with people outside of, in the arts, but not necessarily in the classical arts and coming right. together, right? And mm -hmm. forming relationships. Yeah. Um, this piece is supposed to be presented in art gallery space and museum ah, space okay. because it is inspired by a series of photography, uh, a photography, a very right. famous photography series, Cindy Sherman's film stills. Okay. Okay. Um, so I basically took four 
images from that series that spoke to me and mm -hmm. um, was inspired to create my own instance of what might be happening in the scene, right? When I, I first see. saw these pieces, right. I, I wanted to hear these women, right? I wanted mm -hmm. to hear what they were saying. I mm -hmm. wanted to know what, what was happening, right? right? That's the incredible ability of Cindy Sherman to really create a whole world within a, within a frame and mm -hmm. uh, within a snapshot. And um, so uh, we, um, I, I picked four different images. Um, I've been working with uh, Royce Vavrick, who's writing the libretto. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and uh, I asked for beautiful, amazing composers if they would each be interested in um, setting one uh, of okay. the scenes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the idea is like, Cindy Sherman, I don't know if you're familiar with her work, but she is yeah. in, mm -hmm. yeah. So she's in every photograph, like it is her transform, right? right? Mm -hmm. And I loved the idea of um, challenging a singer as actress mm -hmm, mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. transform themselves uh, in a musical okay. language okay. Um, as well mm -hmm. um, throughout this uh, series of four different um, scenes. Mm -hmm. And so it's non-narrative, right. but it has a lot of, um, but there is a through line about um, transformation and metamorphosis mm -hmm. and identity and internal versus external and the, you know, the male gaze. And mm -hmm. so all of these, all of these things that um, each individual uh, scene has its own story, but there are a lot of um, overarching themes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's meant to be opera's disruption. R.B. Schlatter is directing it. Okay. And the four composers are Nico Muley, Missy Mazzoli, mm -hmm. Paolo Prestini, mm -hmm. and Ellen Reed. Wow. I know. Wow. It's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. So right now we have all four libretti completed and we have uh, five to seven-ish minutes of music mm -hmm. for each one. So we oh, know wow. what each composer is wanting to do and, um, and kind of how we want to stage it. And it's both um, art installation and it will culminate in a full length performance where all four of the scenes will be presented right. together, mm -hmm. but, it's, but it's immersive theater. Mm -hmm. I mean, the audience is within the play space and right. um, you know, we use uh, sound design mm -hmm. and instruments and voice um, and we play with the voice. And um, so it's, I'm really excited about it mm -hmm. um and we will see i think there will be a great need once we come out the other side there will be a yeah. great need for this kind of immediate intimate musical experience mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that i um that i'm really excited to be able to bring to people right. um but yeah this was um so i had an idea that i had and i i had worked with paula on some of her music and I knew what she was doing at National Sawdust and I, I talked to her about this idea and she really believed in it and, mm -hmm. um, and said yes and took it on and I had a residency there and um, we've been developing it ever since. And wow. it's been very slow, but mm -hmm. I've been learning a lot through the process because I've never uh, really um, been on that side of things. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'm learning a tremendous amount about about producing and what it takes to actually make new work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a, I've always had respect for it, but I have a newfound <laughs> other level of respect. You right, know? right. Um, so I continue, I hope to continue um, that path as well. I think it's happening more and more mm -hmm. with, um, with singers. Uh, <laughs> singing artists, if you mm -hmm. will, um, because so much of our career is dictated by others that if you teach singers that they too can have advocacy and right. bring their creative vision forward, that mm -hmm. there's value in that. There's yeah. great value in yeah. that. Um, and it used to be that way too, right? I mm -hmm. mean, at some point in history, singers were very entrepreneurial. Yes, yes. Um, so that's changing back. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think that's uh, tremendous. And I'm I'm excited whenever I see colleagues um, making work, particularly I think of Anthony Rothkastan. So of mm -hmm. course he's kind of the, um, the band leader with, right. with this. And, right. um, 
but you see singers getting responsibility to really curate series like Julia Bullock and mm -hmm, Sasha mm -hmm. Cook with the SF Symphony. And, right, right. Um, it's, it's, I think it's really important. Mm -hmm. It's really important to, to um, when we were coming up, that's not the messaging that we got. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so it's important that we uh, empower ourselves because we have a tremendous platform and we can do a lot of good. Yeah, you know? exactly. So. exactly. So I'm going to pivot slightly. We're going to wrap up in five minutes or so. Um, but I'm really curious because I spent, I spent last season, I had, I think, 35 weeks on the road, which is tremendous and exhausting. And so, you know, the, this balance between personal life and career is, is a huge challenge. Um, and I know that you are a mother and a performer and yeah. work must be an interesting tightrope act or a you know, balancing act. And yeah, I'm also curious if you think motherhood- You're giving me five minutes, Sarah. You need five minutes for this. <laughs> no, but I sort of want to know, like, how does this motherhood impact your not just career wise, but sort of how you approach art and this the fact that you are a singer impact motherhood? Are there impacts that yeah. are positive and, and negative either way? And, and how do you sort of observe those? And, and yeah, I mean, um, the answer is yes, 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 <laughs> yes. all around. Mm -hmm. I think, again, it shifts depending on where you are in your life. I mean, when Sasha was an infant, it was a tremendously different experience than now that he's six, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, I have infant will travel, you know? I right, mean, right. As, as difficult as it was to be in a, having to figure out where to get the crib and to get to this and to get to there and wherever you are, yeah. mm -hmm. um, at least I could bring him with me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, my marriage is a totally different story <laughs> my, <Yes. laughs> my amazing husband, but you know, but now he's older, and that is not acceptable, in my opinion, for me, right? Everybody's different. But for right, my right. child, um, dragging him around and taking him out of school yeah, and his, yeah, his routine, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, that's, and, but then it'll change once he is 12, right? Or 13 right. or what, right? So it's like this very fluid assessment mm -hmm. always. Right, right. And then, you know, I, do not have the luxury to dictate um, what my seasons will look like. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that I was pretty much given my dream dream season at the Met next year as a mm -hmm. plan artist, which meant that I was pretty much working on every role that I was interested in working on. Right. And I would be there um, as like a nine to five situation, right? I mean, we live in Brooklyn, so. Yeah. yeah. Um, but then the world went cuckoo brain. Yeah. And so, you know, so we're here and who knows what that will end up looking like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I was, I was really banking. <laughs> I was really banking on working from home next year. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Um, and I think for me, the production side and really developing relationships with the company in the city where I work, mm -hmm. um, the, that is important. And mm -hmm. I think that in the future, what will happen, well, we'll see a lot more of that. Mm -hmm. We'll see a lot more of uh, singers and possibly, you know, musicians in rep, right? For right. seasons. Yeah. Because also, frankly, environmentally, it's not great to well, be exactly. constantly getting on getting the airplane. Back right? and forth. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so, um, you know, I had been going on about three to five months a year for the mm -hmm. past five years. And that was, that was really pushing it. Like the limit yeah. was like, um, but uh, you know, it comes down to right now, it's, it's a, it's, it's a balance between um, time and cost. Of course. You yeah. know, mm -hmm. is it financially going to be something both financial, you know, your big three, like, is mm -hmm. it financial? Is it career? Mm -hmm. or, you know, I forget what the third one is right yeah. now, but, um, and if it, if it did not, if it was not worth it for me to be away, then I wouldn't do it. If right. it was worth it for me to be away, then we would all buck up and get through it and figure yeah. it out, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's kind of how it had, has been going. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, um, 
I've been fortunate enough to, as my husband, because we did a, we lived in California for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Hi, San Francisco, right. by the way. Yeah, I miss <laughs> you. And I was fortunate enough to create relationships with the Opera Parallel and mm -hmm. San Francisco Opera while I was there. Right. Um, so, you know, that's been nice to know mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. I can also be flexible with where I live. Right. But really, New York is our home base yeah. and we are not giving up on New York. Mm -hmm. So um, we will be back. Um, and uh, I mean, I know that the Met will be back yeah. and I know that Sawdust will make it through this mm -hmm. um, because I have hope. And, um, you know, I fully believe in coming back and bringing life back into the city and bringing art and mm -hmm. live performance back mm -hmm. into the city. And, and, you know, hopefully Untitled will tour and hopefully it'll tour in the summer and then I can just bring Sasha and my right, husband right. And, and, nothing and just they can go have fun and, yeah. you know, we can yeah. make work. And, but it's all, you know, it's always a balance and it's an individual choice. It's an individual thing. And you really have to, you really have to evaluate, um, what your family needs, right? Because you're a family unit. It's not mm -hmm. just you. What what everyone needs to be happy and healthy, and what you need to be happy, right? And healthy, right. You know. Yeah. And yeah. you make that choice for yourself. And I I know we have to close up, but I just wanted to say one last thing is that you know, the other I think the biggest thing that's kind of come out of cultivating my own family and mm -hmm. my own life as an adult mm -hmm. is that success is a personal definition. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So there is no there is no poster child of what a successful musical career looks like. Right. Right. You know, mm -hmm. um, and music doesn't leave you. Mm -hmm. um, and so however you realize it in a way that's fulfilling for you mm -hmm. is success. You know, I so. love that. I love that. Yeah. Just the individual nature of that. I mean, it could look different for everyone and I think exactly. it's important that it's like it a snowflake like yeah. snowflakes <laughs> everyone has their own We're their own, own <laughs> yeah their own snowflake of success you know yeah. I mean there is no right or wrong yeah it's just what's right for you yeah um yeah so you just got to keep asking the right questions and checking in and um being brave and mm -hmm. moving forward so those are just thoughtful words and I really, <laughs> no, I really appreciate them because you just make me think too because I think that's a question we all have as, as musicians what does success look like and you know especially in these times it's really challenging to you know sort of address what that will look like what that did look like what it will look like in the future and uh, right yeah well you just gotta know, roll with it we're gonna yeah. all roll with it um Thanks so much. I just I learned a bunch, and I haven't seen you for ages. So I know it's, it's been it's been a while. Yeah. It's so wonderful to see you and connect. And, and I, I'm so uh, congratulations to you <laughs> on all of your incredible success. Well, thanks. Um, what seems like success to me, but um, and uh, I hope we get to make music together sometime. I know that, that would be cool. amazing. Yeah, <laughs> that would be great. Years. Yeah, we'll, we'll get, get there to that point. Um, this was Eve Gilaudi. I'm Sarah Hicks. Hey, thanks everyone for joining me. Um, next week, we talk to bass player Joseph Conyers of the Philadelphia Orchestra. <gasps> hi, Joe. Friend, yeah, Joe. Tell him I said hi. I will tell him <laughs> that you said hi. Um, Eve, thanks. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much. All right. Take bye. care. Bye-bye.